So if you're new, we're in this series called Freedom right now. We kicked it off a couple weeks ago, and man, it's loosely affiliated with the freedom groups that we offer. Many, anybody in a freedom group? Anybody in a freedom group? Great set of small groups, might consider plugging into one of those. And in this series, we've been dealing with some of those root issues that we have inherited as, inherited as part of our lives as human beings. So last week, we talked about our threefold nature as humans. We are spirit, soul, and body, right? Anybody remember that? Spirit, soul, and body. So we are spirits that have a soul that live in a body, and we discussed that. So if you missed it, I would encourage you to go back and watch that message. And last week I shared something that on its surface could be just a little bit controversial, maybe a little bit hard to accept, but the fact that we are all sinners by birth. We don't have to be taught to sin. It's something sadly that comes natural to us. And today we're going to explain a little bit more about where that came from. We're going to deal with some challenges as it relates to that. And then we're going to offer up some antidotes of how we could become free in this particular area of our life. How many of you want to be free in this life? Free to live for Christ. Free to live. Amen. Father, we thank you and praise you. And you are our King. You are our Savior there is no power greater than the name of Jesus, as we sung earlier, that name that is above every other name. We are all sinners in need of a Savior, and we come to this gathering with the acceptance of that. We come to this gathering with the acceptance that you are the one who died in our place for our sins, that we might have life. We love you. We praise you. We give you glory today. We ask you to come, even as you've inhabited the praises of your people. Holy Spirit, would you teach us during this message? Would you give us the ability to focus? Would you give us the ability to hear? Would you give us the ability to see? And would you give us the ability to put this word into practice in our everyday lives? In Jesus' name, amen. So if we're all born sinners, where did that start? Where did it come from? Why do we live in this world that is so wrecked by sin that we see all around us, where we see these casualties of this war that I've been sharing with you that's going on in the heavenly places? Why do we see these truths as self-evident in our lives? And how do we overcome them? I believe there is a path to overcoming. You see, as we kicked off this year, I made this case that we truly do live in a world at war. Do you all believe that? Yes. All right, then we're in the right place. Do you believe that? Yes, we live in this world at war. There's this sin nature that's going on that's warring in the heavenlies over godly nature and who God is, and the devil certainly wants to take us out. So whether you fully accept that or not, I fully believe it to be the truth. And then there's a few things that can happen in this life. Sadly, many people choose to sit on the sidelines and kind of put their head into the sand to the nature of the war that's going on around us, right? Others fully engage in it. They want to advance the kingdom of God. They want to see the kingdom of God break through, that darkness might subside, that our cities might be transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. And then there's others of us that are simply getting whooped up by the devil all the time, whether we care to admit it or not, right? We fall into those groups. So where did this come from? Where did it all start God says some very challenging things in his word. We're going to deal with those challenging things first, and then we're going to circle back around and bring some great deal of hope. So Matthew 12, 30 says this, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Those are some very challenging words aimed at unbelievers and believers alike, right? So none of us want to stand against God and be in opposition to God, do we? But in fact, it says that before we're born again, we certainly are. We'll dive a little bit deeper into that. But there's something in there also that says, as believers, we should be about this work of gathering. We should be about this work of sharing the good news of the gospel. And he offers up these cautions that are in the midst of that, that if you're not advancing the kingdom of God, then guess what? There's some danger zone, flashing yellow, flashing red lights that we might need to consider. Romans 5 verse 10 begins to shed just a little bit more light on it. He says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So he's saying that we are either for him or against him, that we are either enemies of God or we're people that are advancing the kingdom of God with everything that we have in our lives. 
There's one more verse that's found in Revelation that's actually quite disturbing as well. It says, aimed at believers, this one's aimed at believers. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's a pretty scary thing to think about, is it not? God wants us to be a people who are passionate, a people who are on fire for our God. Each of us expresses that passion in very different ways, right? So I'm a middle-aged white guy. When it comes to expressive worship, the extent of my outward appearance when it comes to worship is like, hallelujah, Jesus. Because if I start dancing, I'll start scaring everybody away. Come on, Jesus, right? But I love it when others are very expressive in their worship of God. Can I get an amen to that, right? I mean, it's awesome. So I'm not talking necessarily about some external passion where we express ourselves, which can be a beautiful thing, but we express ourselves by using our heart skills, abilities, talents to advance the kingdom of God. We could be very passionate by serving God with everything that we have within us, right? Thus, we have a serve fair back there today that we'll tell you a little bit more about as we continue on. But I think what I hear God already saying is that to be a Christian means that you can't be sitting on the sidelines because there's a war that's going on. There might be these moments where we need to get healed up, these moments where we need to get patched up, but the nature of being a Christian is that we're supposed to be engaged in this battle to advance the kingdom of God in our generation. That is the calling on the life of every believer. That's what you're here for. That's what God created you for, to be on a forceful advance of the kingdom of God, to hold back the spirit of darkness in our generation. So if what I'm saying is true, where did it start? Where did this battle begin? Why do we suffer from some of the things that we suffer from? If you look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, we see the beginnings of the rebellion that kicked off this epic battle that continues to go on in heavenly places even today. It says, how are you fallen from heaven? O day star, son of dawn. How are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. He's speaking of the devil here in his I will statements. I will, I will, I will. And he concludes with this very powerful statement that is rebellion, that is cosmic treason. He says, I will make myself like the most high. And thus he got the boot out of heaven very quickly in Jesus name, right? Boom. He got the right foot of fellowship. Some of you experienced that at previous churches, right? He gets kicked out of heaven as a result, rightly so. His act was treasonous. He was coming against God. He was saying, I will be like God. He wanted to be worshiped. And sadly, he ends up taking a third of the angels with him who become now demonic powers and principalities that are set against the people of God to see us destroyed. Why does he want to destroy us? Because the Bible says in Genesis 1.26, we've read this almost every week this year, you were created and formed in the image of God. See, the devil looks at you and he hates God. So when he looks at you and he sees that you're created in the image of God, he hates you and he wants to take you out and he'll do anything that he can to take you out. He hates you because he sees this glimmer of God within you. So where did the rebellion start in the human heart? You go all the way back to Genesis chapter three, right? The devil's there as a snake in the garden. And he goes to want to pull off this great deceit of which he sadly was successful. He comes to Eve, he slithers in there and he sees this beautiful garden and he wants to displace it. He sees a place where God and man are living in community and communion with one another and he wants to make his darn best to disrupt it because he's the one who wants to be like the most high God. He is the one who wants to be worshiped. He looks for his opportunity to pounce. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord had made. 
And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree that is in the garden or of of any tree that is in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die for God knows with it that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. The first thing I want you to see started in the first sentence. He was more crafty than anything else that God had ever made. The devil is a powerful demon, powers and principalities in heavenly places. We are not equipped or able to overcome him in and of ourselves. He will overtake us every time. He's more wise than you are. He's more smarter than you'll ever be. But thanks be to God, we have Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome that which he wants to bring against us, right? But you can't mess with the devil and think you're gonna win. In freedom and future messages, we're gonna talk about open doors and closed doors. You can't open doors and allow the devil to come in and think you ain't gonna get whipped. It's going to happen because he is powerful. He is crafty. He is deceitful. He's the king of all lies. He's the liar, right? We see that in scripture. So he comes in and lies and deceives. And what is the lie that he tells them? The same one that caused him to get kicked out of heaven. You will be like God. You will be like God. So they eat of the fruit, and then guess what? Ever since that moment, our first father and mother, sin ushers itself into the world, and inside of each of us in our DNA, as we've been talking about, some of the things from our human nature that we need to get rid of, the old things that need to die, the old things that need to pass away, somewhere deep within each of us resides this desire to be like God. Instead of reflecting the image of God, instead of reflecting his glory and pointing people towards him, we want to be heroes of our own stories. Think about it. There's probably ways in which that's come to pass in your own life. Oftentimes, it's manifested in the same things I shared about the devil, selfishness, jealousies. None of y'all are selfish, are you? Anybody selfish in here? See, I, I, have, I have bad problems with that because I was like a single child, you know, of a single mom, and I have issues. I'm just saying. I don't know how Mary Jo puts up with that. I love her dearly for doing that. She's an overcomer, but there's this tendency in me, even as a 50-year-old, that I still want to say me, mine, right? Often manifests itself in the form of remote control, right? You want to have control of the remote and control of the TV and Some of you are shaking your heads, right? So that's a very minor manifestation of the selfishness that resides deep within me. But there are other areas of my life where it manifests itself even more poorly, where I make life about me. I want to be worshiped. I won't ever say that, but I want everybody to like me. I want you to like me. And if you don't, I feel really bad about it, right? Don't we all in our generation go on places like Facebook and then we post our posts out there of the best picture that we could pick of that particular day after we took 36 other pictures to just get that perfect one and then we go out there praying that a whole bunch of people like us on Facebook, right? We express these things. They're inherent to who we are, some of which can be good, others of which are contrary to the gospel. They're the exact opposite of God's nature. But there's that desire deep within us to be the center of our universe. Me, myself, and I is the unholy trinity that plagues us all. Even as believers, it wants to rear its ugly head more often than we would like if we're honest, right? It wants to creep up and make life all about us, our wants, our needs, our desires, our pains. There's an antidote to it. We'll get to it in just a couple minutes. But man, it is something that plagues us all. Does anybody agree with me? Or is it only me? I got issues, right? C, we want to be heroes of our own stories. But the fact of the matter is, it's not our story so much that's being written. It's his story, right? History is being written. The beauty for those of us who believe is that God invites us to be a part of his story, 
He wants you and I to play a part in his story, this redemptive story of all mankind in our generation where we get to share the good news of the gospel, where we get to serve, where we get to live in community with others, where we get to see darkness pushed back and the kingdom of heaven advanced in our own generation. And we desperately need that here in our city. We need a group of people who will not sit passively by, but a people who will engage. I think they came out with that most recent statistic again about Jacksonville being the murder capital of Florida. We should all be crying out, not on my watch, not on my watch, not on my watch. We gotta go out there and share the good news of the gospel with everyone we can with the hope that God would touch them and change them and transform them. You see, even in the midst of all the challenging stuff that I've shared so far, in the midst of the treason that was in the garden, God offers a glimmer of hope in Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He's speaking of this day in the future where none other than Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, would put Satan's head under his heel and crush him where there one day would be that victory for all of us to partake in the victory that was the cross and the victory that is to come in the future where it'll be a once and for all time kind of victory. Is anybody excited about that? God will put the devil in his place. See, while we were once enemies of God, we no longer have to be enemies of God. We no longer have to be bound by selfishness. We can be restored to right standing with God. Where does it start? Many of you have already taken this particular step, this particular jump. It says in Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Many of you have taken that step. You are saved. Is anybody saved and fired up in this place? Here's where we get a little bit more into our different natures. See, our spirit man is born again. We become alive to the things of God and the spirit of God. We are no longer enemies of God. Our old man, our old nature that was selfish in nature begins to pass away and all things begin to become new. We desire different things that are godly in nature, yet if we're honest, there always is and always will be this battle with our flesh, right? It's not gonna go away until the day that we go on to be with Jesus. We're gonna have it. There's a war that's going on in your very body. The old man wants to rear his ugly head more often than we'd ever care to admit, right? He wants to creep back up, so how do we battle against that? I'll give you at least one option to battle against it today. There are many that we'll continue to explore during the course of this freedom series, but I'm telling you, God wants to release a new mission into your life, a mission to partner with him in his story to be about the rescuing of others, getting outside of ourselves and our own nagging selfishness to replace it with a selflessness. Where does it start? It starts with an admission. I've got issues. Do any of you have issues? I have issues. Lord, would you forgive me for my sins? Lord, would you forgive me for my selfishness? Would you forgive me for my jealousy? Would you forgive me for my desire to be liked? Would you forgive me for my desire to be like you instead of pointing people to you? Lord, I don't wanna live for the things of this world. I don't wanna live so that I can be exalted. Lord, I wanna live that you might be exalted. What a great place to start. And then Jesus gives us some examples in his word of how we can put that into practice. And one of my favorite, absolute favorites is found in Matthew 20, 26. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Those red letter words, you know the ones that Jesus spoke himself that you find in the New Testament? Those were some of them that we just read. Jesus himself, speaking of himself, said those words. He demonstrated it with his actions. He said, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. So one of the ways that I've found in life that is the best antidote for me to help avoid selfishness in my life is to try to live selfless through serving inside and outside the walls of the church. 
wherever I can find myself. Inside the walls of the church, man, there are plenty of opportunities and outside there are even more opportunities. In fact, do you know of all the miracles that Jesus performed, all but like one or two of them actually occurred outside the walls of the church, not inside the walls of the church? That means we need to go out there into the city and out there into the streets and the byways and share the good news of the gospel so God can manifest himself through our lives that we might see people's lives changed by the power of the gospel, right? I do believe that the calling on every believer is one of service. It's something that you can't avoid. Something that we might try to avoid but it's something that we can't avoid. Ultimately, there comes a day where we're gonna, either gonna walk like Jesus walked or we're not gonna walk like Jesus walked. And I realize each of you came through these doors at very different stages potentially, so let's walk through a couple of those stages. Some of you are already serving with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Continue to use your heart, skills, and abilities to make a difference for the King of kings and Lord of lords. Continue to point people towards him instead of towards yourself. Continue to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Don't take pride in what you're doing. Allow the Lord to continue to work through you to change the world around us and bring the good news of the gospel to all who are hurting, right? Man, keep that up. You are to be commended. Others of you, you walk through these doors and maybe you came from another church, a church where you were hurt as a result of your serving. Shame on them for doing that to you. If you walked through here and you were bruised and hurting because you stepped out of your comfort zone and you served and somebody or that organization itself did you wrong, shame on them. Not shame on Jesus, shame on them. God's called you as a masterpiece to do good works. Don't let what they did to you hold you back forever because the devil is a liar and he wants to keep you held back. You need to step up and use the God-given gifts that he's placed inside of you to advance the kingdom of God here or somewhere else, wherever God's called you to go, wherever he's called you to be. Use those gifts. The body needs you. But don't hold on to that bitterness. Don't hold on to that anger. Some of you maybe not even out of anger, but you're in here and you're saying like, I done my time. <laughs> I done my time. <laughs> Man, God wants you to serve for a lifetime. And I venture to say that maybe you were serving in an area that you weren't called to serve. Maybe you gotta find that right area where God really has called you to serve because see all of us, the saying that I have around here is all of us will serve out of need for a short time and there's a need for that. What do I mean by that? The analogy I always give, if you're at your house and ain't nobody taking out the garbage, it's gonna get pretty stinky up in there real quick, right? How many of you like to take out the garbage? I mean, you're just, it's, you're thrilled. Nobody? I mean, like a couple of you, like one or two, right? You guys are weird, 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 but we love you, we love you. We need people like you in our lives, right? There's this need at times to serve that's outside of our calling, which is okay, we gotta do those things, right? But ultimately, you want to serve in your area of giftedness so that you could serve for a lifetime, so that you're fulfilled each and every week that you walk through the walls of Journey Church. So examples, there's many of them back there, but some of you might be in here and you're in nurses or in the medical field or you're in the Navy and you're a corpsman or you name it, you've got skills in that area. And we have teams like the incident response team where thank God your skills are rarely used around here. Hallelujah, Jesus, amen. We rarely need something like that. But for those moments, we've had issues like where somebody had a heart attack here once and was got to the hospital, everything was okay. There was other times people bumped their head and things happened, you know, from time to time. But you're there to use your skills that you have to help the people of Journey Church during that weekend, right? Others of you are bright, shining faces that smile and welcome people in here with the love of Jesus Christ. Man, would you use that smile to be a part of our greeting team and go help welcome people when they walk in, right? Some of you is in the first service. There was a number of teachers in the room. Thank God for teachers. You guys are amazing. Thank you for teaching our children and the next generation and sowing into their lives. What a blessing. There's other people that help work the altar or have skills with video and web and all the things that you've described. Find your place inside the walls of the church that you could serve, but also outside the walls of the church. 
Serving doesn't stop here. This is the start of it. This is where we're taking care of the house of God and the people of God that he brings through the door. And what a beautiful thing it is when people walk through the door and surrender their life to Jesus and we get to participate in that and celebrate that and see them get baptized. What a beautiful, wonderful thing that is we all participate in. So what does it mean to serve outside the walls of the church? Wherever you find yourself, say you are that teacher, right? You're the teacher that's serving and you're out there in your classroom. I know in our day and age, sometimes you can't just overtly share about Jesus in the public schools, right? But you can love those kids with everything that you have within you. Demonstrate the love of Jesus to them very actively in all that you do. Demonstrate it to the other staff members that you work with. Whatever your vocation might be, would you be that person when somebody is in need, they go, that person's a follower of Jesus. I'm going to go talk to them and ask them about it. I need help. Would you be that person in your work environment? In your neighborhood, would you be that person that's the go-to person? Remember when you first moved into that neighborhood? Most of us, we were super excited to get into that neighborhood. We were so proud of the house that God had given us, and we were excited to get there and be a part of that neighborhood. And then you get there. How are you being a good neighbor to your neighbors? God planted you on purpose there for a reason, right? And if you're here and you're a guest of somebody, last week I did share something like, if you hate your neighbor, bring him. I'm sorry. No, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. (laughs) Absolutely teasing. We are so glad you're here. What can you do? You could do something as simple as invite your neighbor to come to church with you. Or you can go next door and help mow their lawn. Or you could go next door and be nice. Or you could talk to them, invite them over, whatever it might be. In our generation, neighboring is a forgotten art. We put up our walls and we hide in our houses and we don't talk to the people around us. But God planted you there on purpose and for a reason. There's other opportunities through your hobbies and the things that God's given you as desires in your heart that you could use to go out there and love on this community that surrounds us and tell them about Jesus. Here's the key. You can't sit on the sidelines for too long. You can't sit, that you're not created to do that. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are created in your very DNA. The second you surrender your life to Jesus, your old man passes away and part of your new nature lines up with Jesus and his word and you have a desire to serve and not to be served, amen? So I pray today before we go, I've got a couple things I wanna share before we go to bring it to a full conclusion, but. You know, I shared a couple weeks ago that I prayed that we'd have 110% participation in our small groups. I said that every member of Journey would go and that they would invite other people. And some of you have been doing that. In fact, during our first service, I met at least two families that first came to small groups and then came here. Praise God. Thank you. Keep that up. Keep inviting people to groups that you think might not come here because guess what? They came to a group and then they came here. Praise God. It's doing exactly what we are praying for and believing God for. And I just lost my train of thought exactly what I was going to do. It'll come back to me. I told you I'm getting old. But I want to encourage you after the service to don't just walk out of here if you're not yet plugged in. On your chairs, there's some serve cards that you could fill out. You could look at different ones. If you're just interested in getting more information about that group, check it. They'll get back with you with more information. But... Many of them are set up in the back. There's people that come here on Thursdays and help repair the building for the ability to have church on the weekends. There's tons of opportunities. If you're not yet plugged in, please browse those different opportunities and find that place where you can plug in and use your heart to serve God. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So earlier I read from the book of Romans, and this is what I want to close with. The apostle Paul was passionate about the people of Rome. He loved them with everything that was within him, and he wanted to see them saved. And this is how they put it in Romans 10.1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. There was something within them that he could just see that zeal being expressed. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not to submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What does that mean in a nutshell? We have this old sinful nature that stands as an opposition to God. We stand as enemies to God. Yet 
We seek out this righteousness that is of our own. We want to be like God and we try to do it on our own. We are self-made people and we're proud of it here in America. But what he's saying is that there's no way that you could ever achieve that in the law. But there is one who did that on our behalf. His name is Jesus Christ. He surrendered his life up as a love offering that you and I could surely have life and freedom in him. And even as Paul's heart is, my heart and the heart of many of the people of Journey Church resonates for the city of Jacksonville and the surrounding areas, that we would see people get saved, that we would be a part of this forceful advance in our own generation of seeing our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. And I desperately want you to become a part of that if you've not already done so. But even more important than becoming a part of a movement of God where we're serving and making a difference, my heart is that if you've not surrendered your life to Jesus, that you would do just that. Where does that start? We actually read it earlier in Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read one or two verses beyond it because I think they're glorious. And then we're going to close. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. You will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Have you called on the name of the Lord? Have you said, Lord, would you save me? Lord, I surrender my life to you. I don't know how you walked through these doors. Were you the fired up Christian, excited to do life, excited to advance the kingdom of God? Did you walk in here and maybe you are a believer, your salvation is secure, but you're a little more lukewarm than you'd care to admit? Or did you walk in here in some ways as was young one man in the first service who said he was an enemy of God, but God's doing something in his heart and that's why he's here. He's wanting to hear about this king who might save him. Maybe that's you. Have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus? If not, this is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity. If you've been living a little more lukewarm than you'd like, and today's a day where you know you just need to rededicate your life to him, your salvation's not on the line, but you're here to just say, God, I really want to serve and live for you from this moment forward. Man, we would love to join you in either of those prayers. I promise to do nothing to embarrass you, but I would love to pray with you. So if that's you and nobody looking around, is today a day where you need to either dedicate or rededicate your life to God? If it is, would you do me a favor and just hold your hand up real high so I can see it? You can do that now. I see your hand and yours and yours and yours. Thank you, Father, and yours. Thank you, thank you, and yours. <clears throat> Again, I promise not to embarrass you. I truly do. But it says that, man, if we will stand up for him, he will stand up for us. If you raised your hand and are ready to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, would you do me a favor and come right up here so I could join hands with you and pray with you. And everybody around you is gonna clap like there's no tomorrow. If that was you, come on up right now, come on up. Glad you're here. Come right here. You can just face me. Lord, I join with those who have come up front this morning, and I would ask everybody in the congregation to just say this after me. Say this with me. Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life and life in you. Jesus, we renounce our sins. We lay them at the foot of the cross. And we thank you that we're forgiven. We thank you that we're set free. We thank you that we get to live for you in this life and into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Give them a big round of applause. They've got some stuff they'll give you as resources and next steps. Come on, Journey Church. Give them one more big round of applause. Our God is good. Man, I can't thank you.
you enough for being here, for continuing to invite people. I pray that if you're not plugged in, you will plug in before you go. Have a great week. God bless you guys. If you're new, coming up and say hello. It would be an honor to meet you.